Uh, I'm Mark Sussman, the editor of Willamette Week. Delighted to be here with Cupid Alexander and Winter Johannes. Cupid is the director of strategic initiatives for Mayor Wheeler. Um, Winta is, I don't know if it's president or executive director of uh, Albina Vision Trust or, or both Managing those Managing director. Great. Um, so, um, you know, we're here to talk um, because uh, Albina Vision announced just the other day that it was withdrawing support for the current proposal to expand I-5. Um, and that's why we want to talk to both of you. But I think it's fair to assume that there's um, some, uh, a lot of ignorance around what the hell is Albina Vision. So I'm wondering if you could each take a minute and I'm gonna suggest this because it strikes me that Albina Vision is both a proposal for a thing, a thing being a real estate development, if you will, but it is also a bit of a moral imperative. And I'm wondering if you could um, sort of talk about it in that way. Sure. Well, so, you know, I would never lead with Albina Vision being a real estate project, right? So Albina Vision is about people and it's about coming together to think about redevelopment in a way that centers people first. And so our mission is to revitalize the Lower Albina neighborhood in Portland which is roughly um, from the Broadway Bridge to the Steel Bridge and then the river uh, up around I-5. And the reason um, that we are so uh, focused on making sure we put people first in our, in our efforts is that the, the way that Albina Vision came together um, started a few years ago when a, when a group of community leaders came together uh, convened by Mayor Hales and the Trailblazers, and their charge was to think about redevelopment. But that group of people said, we can't think about redeveloping for the future without first acknowledging what's happened here in the past, that there already was a neighborhood here, that there are histories and stories and a culture that was lost here. And so the future depends on our ability to grapple with the past and to think about who we build this neighborhood for, um, and the area that you are seeking to redevelop or rebuild with housing and mixed retail and parks is an area that not long ago was sort of the center of black life and culture in Portland. Yes. Um, and I would add it was where the, um, the most black people lived in the entire state of Oregon. Be a little bit more specific about why. Uh, your organization went to pull its support from uh, Department of Transportation's I-5 plans and then Cupid, why uh, the mayor's office um, did so as well. For two years, we worked tirelessly with them, providing technical support through our board members who have, um, you know, all sorts of professional uh, backgrounds, providing our input, um, ideas about engagement, and of course, engaging with um, the city of Portland, Multnomah County Metro uh, to, to try to get to the right project. And what has become really clear in the last few months is that we were never going to be able to get to the right project. And in fact, the project that's on the table right now, which doesn't help the economic development goals that we were pursuing, that doesn't adequately address the needs of the children who are here today, especially those at Tubman, and the children that we expect to be in Lower Albina in the future, um, that given all of those considerations, it actually was more harmful for us to participate than to walk away and say, this is not good for our city. I was under the impression that there were two substantial stumbling blocks. One is that Albina Vision and the mayor want the expansion to be capped cover the freeway and then providing real estate land to provide uh, corridors to the river um, so that you're not creating an island. And that DOT has been unwilling to do that because it's enormously expensive. Is my understanding that that was a significant breaking point for your organization, is that correct? Well, one of the considerations, one of the considerations we had, Mark, is that's absolutely, absolutely something that we thought about. Community con connectivity and the ability to create opportunities as a result of capping 
were a strong, strong consideration. But that's notwithstanding all the other things that we mentioned also. Because collectively, without those other things, that's what creates the disadvantage. And I think it's disingenuous to say that it would be like one or two things when it's a suite of things. But those were strong considerations. Okay, well, in terms of my awareness of your concerns, it strikes me that DOT can probably respond to a lot of them and they can cap the freeway. It's just a question of money. The Harriet Tubman issue is one that I'm more puzzled about because it just strikes me as a, I don't know how you work yourself around it. And for our viewers, Harriet Tubman is the traditional black middle school in Portland. It was threatened to be closed in what, 2012 or no, more recently. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it is currently proximitous to I-5. And a number of tests has be done, have been done to show that the air in the area is just poisonous. It's toxic. Um, sort of a great example of environmental racism. Uh, a lot of money has been spent on HVAC systems in the Harriet Tubman. The expansion would bring I-5 closer, correct, to Tubman. How do you possibly resolve that? So, Mark, I think this gets to what Cupid was talking about, right? That there was not one or two issues. All of us um, who have signed on as partners in many letters to the OTC over the last year, uh, so that includes Albina Vision, the mayor's office, Commissioner Daly's office, Metro, and Multnomah County Commissioner Vega Peterson, we've always said that the way that you can address these issues is by comprehensively looking at the project. And so, you know, if there is a process to evaluate the entire scope, then you can actually problem solve these issues one by one. What we never got from ODOT was a willingness to, to explore with us what is worth having for a half a billion to a billion dollar investment. And if what we have is a project which, you know, you've described, then that's not enough. And so, you know, it's, it's so much easier, I think, to reduce this down to an issue about caps or an issue about a school when really it's a comprehensive issue about the Department of Transportation, once again, looking at our communities as one that they can run through without considering the people and communities that exist around it today and in the future. It's the old, if you build it, they will come. What if you build it, they don't come. And the example I'm gonna use, Cupid, I think comes out of your office or Prosper Portland, which is uh, there was an effort to write checks to people who had been displaced from the neighborhood because of the Emanuel urban renewal uh -huh. to encourage them to move back. You were basically providing cash incentives to people to move back to their neighborhood. Uh -huh. And it was largely unsuccessful. Uh, what, what are the metrics of success? Because it was successful. And in fact, um, that was one of the programs that I helped develop and run. What we uncovered is that many individuals, because they did not have additional income, were finding it hard to purchase at market rate. So we teamed up with partners to create additional housing in North and Northeast Portland. And I think that if you checked with the Housing Bureau, they would show you that upwards of 80% of those individuals who had the highest level of displacement generationally that were African-American have moved back by the hundreds and, the whole, and, and they're in the process of home ownership because once we tell you like, hey, here's an opportunity, if you qualify for the money at 60% area median income, there's still the process of becoming mortgage ready at a time you never knew that you would have the opportunity to do it. So um, I hear what you're saying, um, but I think that that doesn't tell the whole story. Because if I were to say to someone, hey, we have this money, they're like, oh, yes, but they're going to need some time to get ready for that home ownership opportunity. And which is what we found. And you've seen a lot more success over the past three years because you can't expect people after, you know, 50, 60 years of division in the city to get it together in a, a week or a month or even a year. But they have the ability to do that. And we've shown that, especially those who are hardest to reach. I, I think that it's been successful, but these things are hard if we're going to be honest. It's like you can't have generations of people by no effort of their own who didn't have opportunities due to infrastructure projects 
and then redlining and then a whole list of different things that eliminated opportunities for them and say, get it together in a year. And if you don't, that's not success. Also, you still have to be generationally poor, you know, to take advantage of this. Like, that's the truth of it. So in order to do that, you need a mechanism that leverages a lot of different things to create an opportunity, just like we did when we expanded um, uh, secured mortgages after World War II, except certain individuals couldn't get them. And when I say certain individuals, I'm saying black, right? But their taxes help secure those loans. So you're just being denied an opportunity. And I see this as reconciliation. This is by no means reparations, right? This is this is not, we shouldn't even say things like that because- can, 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 can understanding the quicksand that, in case you haven't figured out, I'm white, um, can, can we talk about those terms a little bit? Because <laughs> I think whites as a general matter are really scared of the word reparations. Right. So, I, I, and, I, and, and, and yet, and at the same time, at least from my point of view, what you're trying to do is in fact reparations, and that's fine. But so, it's not what Mark. And I'll so, no, so talk. help me. So, I, find I, the difference remember, between reconciliation so Mark, and reparations. Mark, think of it this way, right? Discrimination resulted, it was the most inclusive process we had because it had one requirement you be black. And that's how discrimination worked reparations would have to work that same way. These programs have income requirements. They have all the things that discrimination didn't have, right? They, were, they weren't like, oh, you made $100,000 and you're a doctor. They were like, you're still black. We're going to discriminate against you. So this can't be reparations. This is not even that conversation, but it is a reckoning and a reconciliation, you know, in my opinion, where it's like, you know what? There were, there were, things systemically that disadvantage. And if you're still disadvantaged, we're going to work to create an opportunity because we're, we're that good in Portland, we're that forward thinking, and we would love to see our neighbors continue to move up because we want to provide the best quality of life imaginable. And I think that that's the beauty. So Winter, I'm sorry for taking so much space up. I'm over no, here. No, 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 that was great. Believe me, 